So I think we can get started now, I guess, unless if you guys want to wait for another minute or what? I think we can get started. Yeah, let's I go for the introduction. Um, okay, hi everyone, welcome uh, to Use It or Lose It, Insights into Building Resiliency in Online Learning for English Language Learners. Um, today, this will be presented by Dr. Nirmla Flores and Dr. Kimi Tang. Um, I just wanted to quickly go over a few logistics before we get started. Um, so if you kind of direct your attention to the right-hand side where the chat is, um, you'll see a few different icons. Um, one of them is the chat. You can use that to ask any questions or any comments during the presentation. Um, and then uh, two over, there's the polls section, which we'll be using during the presentation. You can use that to answer some of the questions. Um, and then one last thing, there will be some time uh, here and there in the presentation to uh, ask questions aloud. Um, if you kind of uh, look on the uh, screen, there's, there should be an option on the top left-hand side to raise your hand. Um, if you go ahead and click on that, I will be able to give you permission to speak aloud and um, participate more to ask questions. So that's it for me. Um, here are your presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Really appreciate um, your help with this. Um, everyone, welcome. And really do are grateful and excited to be here with you all. Uh, once again, my name is Kimi Tang, and I am representing Cal State Dominguez Hills as well as uh, Cal Lutheran University. And my name is Nirma Flores. I'm with the University of Redlands. And during this presentation, we will discuss key findings and potential implications, drawing on a literature review and our preliminary data of English language learners and educators. We will also provide potential strategies of how instructors can further support and build resiliency among online English language learners despite various challenges. Kimmy, you're on mute. Kimmy, you're on mute. <laughs> Kimmy, we can't hear you. You're on mute. There you go. There, yes. Yeah, perfect. Yes. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Anyhow, uh, we would like to initially start with um, asking you all to. Um, take a quick self-assessment of your resiliency level, which we have adopted from the Nicholson McBride Resiliency Questionnaire. And uh, we're going to ask you, I will read out the questions and you'll see the questions yourself as well. Take a moment to basically um, identify which number rep best represent you. Um, number one represents strongly disagree and number five represents strongly agree. And please be sure to keep track either on a separate sheet of paper or on your phone, the score that you have identified. Okay, so again, if you could say, for instance, if you put a number five on, on the question number one, make sure you put down a number five somewhere, just jot it down somewhere, keep track of it because you're gonna eventually add them up at the end. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and start out with the very first question and we're gonna open up the pool. So once again, click to the pool section and you'll see the very first question. Um, so, when faced with a difficult situation, I automatically make things right. Go ahead and jot down the number that best represents you, remembering that one is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree. And then once you have jot down, click on the pool which will represent you and then jot down your score on a separate sheet of paper. Second question. I do my best to influence others without being concerned about the degree of this influence. Number three, I am not concerned about people's criticisms of me. Number four, 
My perspectives are typically intact during uncomfortable situations. Number five, I often find myself calm and collective in crisis situations. Number six, I consider myself good at problem solving. Number seven, Generally, I consider myself as an easygoing and carefree individual. Number eight, I am up for any challenges. Number nine, Given a choice, I would rather take charge than be a victim of situations. Number 10, I always follow my intuition. Number 11, my stress level is typically well managed. Last but not least, number 12, I am confident in myself. All right, so go ahead and take a minute to add up your score. And then what you're seeing on the screen is a poll to display your total score. So I think Jacqueline might be able to help us out with that. Um, if you received any um, where between zero to 37, um, you're gonna click on zero to 37 and so on and so forth. Now, uh, here's what the range means. At the developing level, you recognize the benefits for moving forward and being determined. At the established level, you may occasionally have tough days, but you rarely feel ready to give up, so you persist. At the strong level, you have a knack of turning setbacks into opportunities. And at the exceptional level, you tend to bounce back when life or circumstances push you down. It is important, though, to understand that you could be at different levels of resiliency depending on your situation, and no one is ever at the exceptional level at all times. Just like this virtual conference and teaching online, we were all put in a position where your resiliency is being tested. For some, some of you, this whole experience is very frustrating, can be frustrating for us. Therefore, your resilience level may be at a developing, while for some of us, um, you may be at the establishing level of resilience or even at the strong to exceptional level. Some of you had to relearn how to teach online, meaning the new instructional strategies, while at the same time you learn how to speak computer language. Regardless, our resilience level is constantly being tested and is never linear. Just quickly, though, I'm curious um, if any of you, I, I think I see from our poll, there's only one who voted on the overall score, but I, we get it. It's hard to keep track of um, who is able to, um, to take the poll or not, but, but that's fine. We can, we can chat later on about it. So, all right. Okay, you're So in our educational system, uh, racism, uh, racial segregation, disproportionate funding, unequal opportunities to learn, and even gaps in achievement continue to exist. And we already know that, right? And then many of, of those who are often disadvantaged um, 
are by uh, by these particular inequities are oftentimes low incomes, minorities, and English language learners. Um, so as this causes a consequence for English language learners, the impact may be compounded given the intersectionality of race as well as language, uh, leaving them further marginalized in our educational system. And so to combat these specific challenges for English language learners, they must be even more resilient than most people. Now, resiliency is, as defined by Oxford Dictionary, is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. That's essentially it, right? Given the current COVID-19 context, though, students, parents, and educators find themselves being even more challenged than ever. And for example, like we've mentioned earlier, we all have been compelled to quickly learn and adapt to online learning and thus navigate through the multiple challenges of connectivity and access to right equipment and as well as be able to speak a new computer language. Um, this form of adaptation process can be significantly more challenging for English language learners at every level of the education as early as pre-K to higher education, especially uh, since that there are many factors um, that are affecting students' self-esteem, their self-confidence, self-regulations, and autonomy. Um, some researchers argue that um, resiliency can be affected by the environment in order to cope and adapt to changes, but others still contend that resiliency can become uh, influenced or further influenced by cultural and institutional societal factors such as uh, race, systemic racism and or discrimination. Now, although researchers agree that the influences affecting resiliency are complex, there, are, there remains a lack of research on resiliency as it relates to the online learning among English language learners. And that's the reason why we're interested in doing this study. So for the purpose of this study, we build upon the current resiliency framework to examine those complex factors that may affect the resiliency of our university English language learners who are engaged in online learning. Specifically, we propose the following research questions listed on our slide. And here they are. Number one, how do English language learners perceive themselves in their level of resiliency in an online learning form format? Secondly, what impact does access and computer knowledge have in influencing the English language learners' resiliency? And the third, what strategies do educators need to enhance English language learners' resiliency level in online learning? And based on convenience sampling, we surveyed university students who are engaged in online learning from five different undergraduate and graduate classes. And our data collected were then disaggregated, analyzed, and compiled to develop several key themes. And so out of 52 participants, uh, we captured the data of 24 individuals who basically self-identify themselves as English language learners. And hence, uh, we will share some of our findings as it relates to English language learners from here on. So when compared to their non-English language learner counterparts, overall, English language learners participants deem themselves as exceptional in terms of their level of resiliency, scoring slightly higher than non-ELLs. This means that the English language learners are more resilient most of the time, and they frequently bounce back whatever life's throw at them, right? They essentially believed in making things work. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, we want to highlight four components of resiliency, which include greater confidence, stronger self-concept, higher self-esteem, and exceptional self-efficacy. Now, based on our findings, the, both of the groups, both um, not in non-ELLs as well as English language learners scored low in the area of self-esteem and higher in the area of self-efficacy. However, for English language learners, they scored higher in the area of self-concept. I don't think it's surprising because English language learners often have to have greater resiliency to succeed and higher capacity to believe in their own ability to perform mainly because no one else will. All right, so based on our computer, on our, on our survey, most participants deem themselves as advanced in their computer knowledge and skills. 
However, the result is based on their familiar familiarity of the platform they've been using in the past several years. Participants also explain that if a new platform is introduced, they feel like they have to learn a new language again. Therefore, by having to learn a new computer language every time a new platform is introduced, the struggle for English language learners seem to re be recursive. In essence, the participants felt that their level of resiliency is being tested. So as you can see in this graph, it shows how English language learners perceive themselves as computer literate. Interestingly enough, 38% of them see themselves as advanced when asked about their level. In comparison, only 28% of non-English language learners perceive themselves as advanced in computer knowledge. So English language learners also face significant challenges in just navigating and adapting to online learning due to language barriers, lack of technology access, and inequitable uh, distributions of resources. So majority of the identified English language learners perceive themselves as having a strong or exceptional level of resiliency despite all of these challenges of online learning. Um, participant did share with us that most that more access that have um, stated that the more access they have to equipment, computer software, technology supports and online learning and online resources, the more successful they are in adapting to online challenges. In addition, uh, they felt that the more they gain from computer skills, the more knowledge and, and, and also knowledge in themselves, uh, the more they are able to preserve, persevere in their online learning. Now, However, participants expressed that their overall challenges in comprehending basic computer language, despite being delivered in standard English language learning, are quite still quite a challenge, right? So some examples of the computer jargons that often use are um, platform, the word synchronous, the word asynchronous, hybrid, Google Suites, and others. Those are quite uh, a jargon for us. Um, as you can see, there is a plethora of challenges that makes it difficult for English language learners to be successful in their online learning. Therefore, these challenges are testing their level of resiliency. But because these challenges are not new to them, they are learning to navigate the online system just as they would in a traditional classroom setting. The only difference between online learning and traditional setting is the set of terminologies used for the computer platform. Now, in light of the in light of the pandemic, educators are compelled to find solutions to empower their students and strengthen their own resiliency. Now, one way to prepare future educators is through the teaching of self awareness of their own perceived preconceived biases, microaggressions, and expectations in order to recognize and break down barriers of a, the system systematic uh, racism in education. Now, another approach to recognize and break down barriers is um, simply to is to equip them with the knowledge and skills on how to respond and instruct in an equitable and an inclusive environment addressing the needs of culturally linguistically diverse students population some ideas or some ways to empower students could include but not limited to teaching students the self-advocacy skills where they can voice their concerns and stand up their rights another way is to teach students how to build a positive mindset an attitude where they could visualize success and boost self-esteem. But lastly, we can assist students on how to adapt to adversarial challenges by teaching them the skills to deal with the particular conflicts. So please take a moment to kind of reflect on some of these questions, right? The first question is how do teaching practices influence English language resiliency? And in your opinion, what can you do to empower and build resiliency? Um, so could you, would anybody be interested in, in responding to these questions? And, and uh, Jackie, see if you could help us um, unmute, if at all possible, or give them permission to unmute themselves. And yeah, so um, you can let me know in the chat if you'd like to, um, speak about this or you can also uh, raise your hand and um, that should be an option on the screen you're viewing now on the top uh, left hand side and um, 
So the questions again is, how do your teaching practices influence English language resiliency? And then also, and in your opinion, what can you do to empower and build students' resiliency? And we gave you some of the examples. I mean, there's a plethora of different strategies that are out there, but it's always nice to hear what other people do, right? Because that's more of the application part. It's not always theoretical. And it's okay if you don't want to participate. <laughs> we understand. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move forward because we wanna be able to respect your time as well. So here are some ways on how to support fo uh, and to foster resiliency amidst online learning. Um, we've identified four. The first one is to provide authentic evidence of academic success, um, which also uh, is another way of saying competence. Um, and an example would be engaging in a research project relevant in their own lives. Um, and we see that in project-based learning activities in our classrooms. The second one is to show that they are valued members of the community. And um, we also call that a sense of belonging. We want to make our students feel that they belong in a community. And the third one is the reinforce idea that they can contribute to the community in other words, we want to make them feel that they are useful um, in our society uh, through community participation. And the last one, we might we want to make them feel empowered. In other words, uh, the concept of potency should come in through student choices and self-advocacy. So the participants provided insights on how educators can better support and build resiliency during online learning. Interestingly, some of the strategies and techniques identified by the participants for online learning were also were already supported by research studies for traditional classroom face-to-face -face learning for English language learners. In other words, these um, ways to support resiliency were given to us by our participants, and, and it, they were totally aligned with the research studies that are already out there. So here's a question for us to reflect on. What are some potential strategies you can do to foster English language learners' resiliency towards online learning? Anybody who'd want to chime in? Anything that you've done in your own classrooms? Anything that you want to share with us? Um, feel free because we don't have all the answers um to this question so go ahead kimmy if you like to chime in first as an example i was going to say um there's we actually have uh, one person who had mentioned and and shared their perspective and we really appreciate that but they wrote um, as instructors we are sometimes limited when such barriers are institutionalized and come from the above and that is completely true but there are certain things that within our own classroom setting that we could um, control more or less right so one of the things that the the, um, the participant commented on is is the way we delivered online learning right um, so a lot of the strategies that are being done in a traditional classroom could actually be embedded in the online learning such as let's say if we were to create a, a word wall um, that kind of tells out what is the actual terminology or the focus of the terminology for that particular uh, lesson for that day. And then there's a little definition on a side and there's a layman terms type of definition as well. But it takes a lot of time for us to be able to incorporate that in addition to learning new ways and new platforms and new software to be able to embed all that. But you're absolutely right, though. There are definitely barriers in that are institutionalized that it gives us more of a challenge. And we as an adult, as an instructor, are always challenged and our resilience level is also challenged as well. I totally agree with Kimmy. Yeah, there. And, and thank you, Raphael, for um, mentioning that there are barriers, institutionalized barriers. In fact, there, there are so many things that we are um, not in control of. But one thing that I have done that's very fascinating in my classroom is the idea of Flipgrid. I don't know if you've done it before, but it's it's a way to really empower your students to create their own short videos. 
and and share their own thoughts. It's sort of a podcast in a miniature form. So um, if you'd like to know more about it, uh, yeah, feel free to contact one of us or contact me and and I'm happy to share with you what that Flipgrid uh, strategy is all about. And I think that the key too is utilizing universal design for learning, right? Where not every single student's learn the same way and the way we are delivering our our instructions also vary as well. I mean, as you can see, we're, we're, we're learning a new platform for me is a new platform is an event. And so trying to navigate a whole entire understanding of it and trying to incorporate the level of engagement and participation in our presentation is very different than if I were to do it in person as well. So it's a combination of different things. Um, I know that's uh, Cecilia. Yeah, it's mentioned that she would love to share with us. And so I think, there you go. You're given the platform. <laughs> We apologize for the lag. I think it's we're still trying to catch up, and I believe uh, Cecilia will be sharing with us her thoughts. Oh, great! Yeah. Hi, Cecilia. Hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Saturday morning. Um, so something that I've learned, you know, a lot of times I I'm not surprised with the the data information that you have given. Um, you know, these students who come over, if they're university students, they are top students and they are very resilient in their own cultures and in their, their studies in their country. So um, to help them out though, to become familiar with the computer, I give them assignments, first of all, like a real assignment, for example, um, you know, we get into transportation and traveling and then I may have them um, create a travel plan using Amtrak. Mm. And I would allow them to uh, use do it in their own language. So what they do uh, with that, they may um, uh, in their own language, but then present it in English. So they have the opportunity to use the translator, like if it's an Amtrak or um, if they do a flight plan or whatever. Um, they have it once in their language, and therefore they don't, they're not pressured to have to compete in the two languages, meaning, you know, the English and then also in the computer language. That's a great idea. That's a really great idea. It's just being able to build onto that a foundational learning, right? So, yes, um, yes. Yeah. And, and then, you know. Uh, I'm sorry. And then another thing too, like you could, other caveats could be, you know, I know they're simple, but sometimes we forget as educators that, you know, we're, we're, our, our focus is teaching the language. But um, if everybody's on par with the technical devices and platforms, then that works. Right. And um, I'm a K-12 educator uh, right now. And one of the problems that, you know, K-12 is having is that not everybody is at the same levels of technology use, nor are they using the same platforms. And one of the things that I ran across in my class yesterday was um, our devices are also not the same. You know, the, the mm -hmm. things that we need to consider are, you know, some students may be doing all of their technology on their iPhone. You know, their iPhone is a, 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 a very big thing. You know, are they on a PC or are they on a Mac? And those things too, we have to consider. Um, so I think starting easy rather than boom, giving them a big project, start off something easy where they can gain the confidence in using the technology and then gradually introduce the language part. Because, you know, the affect, we have to lower affect someplace. And I think the first part to start with is what, what is easy for them because they already use it in their own language. I totally agree with you, Cecilia. In fact, um, that's uh, what I do in my classroom. Even before I introduce any assignment, I want to make sure I want to know their level. So at the very beginning, the first class is I uh, send out a survey to know what level they're in and what platforms they're familiar with or they've done online learning before. In that way, I can sort of uh, hold them by the hand if, they, if it's their first time. Uh, being online or if they've done it before then they can move on to the next one so I totally totally agree with you Cecilia to start easy and then 
and then pretty much ease your way into the uh, the major assignment. So thank you, thank you so much, Cecilia. Thank you. Really, really appreciate your thoughts, and um, thank you also, Rafael, for um, for sharing your thoughts in the chat. So moving on, if that's okay, uh, Kimi, if there's anything else you want to add. Um, very good, okay. So now that we have uh, provided um, various strategies and given you the opportunity to, to participate, um, we would like to briefly discuss the implications of our study. And here are a few implications. First, we need to further examine more evidence-based strategies for online English language learners. In other words, the ones that we've provided for you are not enough. They're only yeah, touching uh, barely um, the surface, um, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Then we should also explore to what extent technology influences the development of resiliency among online learners, specifically in the areas of access and appropriate use. And then lastly, we should investigate generational gaps and in influences among online English language learners. And we say this because we find out that the younger people have uh, are, are more adept in technology as opposed to our, um, our older students, right? So, so those are our, our implications. So. And so to conclude, um, it is really important for us to understand why some children do well despite adversarial early experiences because it can inform more effective policies and programs that um, help more children reach their fullest potential and become more resilient because that's something that we all of us have to encounter every single day of our lives and it's not only in the classroom setting but in the educational or in the real world more or less right so we would like to end um, with this quotation from robert kennedy and so what it's says is, each time we stand up for an ideal or act to improve the lot, the lot of others or strike out against injustice, we send forth a ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples built a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. All right, so with that, um, here's our contact information and the next two slides are our references. So thank you, thank you very much for taking the time in participating in our presentation. Um, we hope you have gained some insights into how, how to build resiliency among your students. And have a wonderful day, enjoy the rest of the conference and hope to see you in the other sessions. And we are here if you would like to continue to have a conversation, because I know that we still have about 10 more minutes. If there's questions, um, if you want to share with us some more, some of the strategies and ideas that you've encountered, and just feel free, because we're here for, we're here to learn um, with you all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, we feel that whatever study we've done, we're, we're still um, learning a lot more as we uh, go along. So we'd love to hear from you or if you have any questions or if you need us to um, share more thoughts in detail about what we've done in our study, we'd be happy to uh, share that with you. Yes. And uh, also I'd like to do a shout out for Jacqueline for helping us out even prior to this uh, presentation, just to help us with uh, little details. So thank you, Jacqueline. And thank you everyone for participating and for just for simply being here and sharing mm -hmm. with us and really appreciate it. And if you want to learn more about our um, study, feel free to send us an email. We'll be more than happy to share more. These mm -hmm. are just glimpses of some of our results. We actually have, we have a plethora of them, but mm -hmm. for uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we will only allow or able to share a certain amount only due to time constraint. Mm -hmm.
Thank you again, everyone, for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. We had so much fun doing this. Right, Kimmy? So. <laughs> yes. It's a challenge, but yes. it's fun. <laughs> First time at an event. Yes. Um, yeah. It has um, definitely uh, tested our resiliency, our level of resiliency. <laughs> yes. So. What was the pull? Um, we actually just look at yeah it's good oh so five votes oh eight votes okay um jacqueline if you don't mind sharing with us how to access so the fact that we have five votes for example and the overall score how would we know how many people voted or actually you can just click on it huh okay 66 percent mm -hmm said that they're from zero to 37 hmm. and then um 16 percent said they're between 44 to 48 and 16 percent 49 to 60. okay cool so i'm confident in myself i'm curious <laughs> oh there it is okay are you have... able to see everything all of now, now that I'm able to see earlier, <laughs> I wasn't. So, yeah. So, it, I'm confident in myself. 44% actually said agree. Oh, we yeah. actually have another chat from Raphael. Oh, okay. I would be interested to know where, where do people mark themselves and what was the reason behind it and which particular question really draws on them. I know, I know. Thank you, Raphael. You mentioned here, I have uh, asked my students to do one to two minute videos on WeChat, mm. answering a few pre-assigned questions. They send their videos to me and I share with everyone in class. So that probably reminds me of Flipgrid. Flipgrid, mm. you can actually do that too. Oh, WeChat, I've never done that. So thank you, Raphael. Yeah, this is a good tool to have. It is because WeChat is actually free as well. Now, granted, um, I just recently read that the president may be trying to eliminate WeChat, and I wasn't sure whether or not if that still is the case. But um, what you could also do WhatsApp as well. WhatsApp, um, uh, what's even FaceTime? They could definitely record and then be able to share with that and flip through. Absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good to know. So, um, all right. So thanks, Jacqueline, for, uh, yeah, including the Flipgrid uh, link yes. into this chat. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's good. You know, and I think one of the things that we can really have a chance to mention, too, is the opportunity to be able to practice, mm -hmm. right? Because this mm -hmm. is, we're talking about English language learners. And just like in a traditional classroom setting, we're um, allowing the student to practice their English, right? Regardless, wherever level they're at. Similarly, by using what the platform that you're, you're mentioning, Raphael, such as WeChat, um, you're allowing students to practice their English in, in a more conversational and hopefully more of a, you know, personal type of a connection. And I think that's a great idea. It yeah. is hard though. Yeah, especially it's like learning a new language. Yes. If you introduce to them this new platform and it's totally foreign to them, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's going to be a challenge the first time. But right. once they get the hang of it, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful tool and, so. and you know it comes back down to that whole question of whether or not if you're confident in yourself and speaking and hearing and utilizing these specific um mm -hmm. uh video <laughs> screen right because yes. some students yes. may be very shy and they want to be able to record themselves yes. let alone yes. hearing their own voice for the first time so there's mul multiple factors at play so yeah. Raphael yeah. mentioned that you guys use wechat and what's up oh what's up huh um well, I have not heard a WhatsApp line and Telegraph. Ooh. Telegraph, which is encrypted. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for all thank these, for um, yeah, strategies. That's great. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we will definitely make a note of it and uh, put it in, into our toolbox. Yes. Um, yeah. So that's the beauty of this presentation. We're not only passing on information to you, but we're also learning from you guys. So, Absolutely. So great. thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. 
All right. So I think that ends our presentation for today. And yeah. once again, feel free to connect with us um, if you wish, if there are um, things that you'd like for us to know or like for us to answer. And we wish you a very wonderful day today. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Kimmy, for thank being you, a great, great partner. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Jacqueline. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I can go ahead and wrap up the stream um, so we stop streaming now and we'll go back into our own room. Okay. <laughs>